Wood Song by Gary Polson, Day 11. Another long day and into the night and the bone chilling cold. This terrible night, I get too cold. The cold is coming down on me like a death, and I must run to keep my body temperature up. I run 50 paces and ride 50 and run 50 and ride 50 the whole night, and the running brings my body heat back up. But I cannot get enough air through my two wool masks, so I pull them down and breathe straight into my mouth. I get enough air then, but the cold, raw air freezes the sides of my throat, and the blood vessels burst, and my throat generates mucus, and soon I am choking on it. It is very hard to clear. I must stick a finger down my throat to help pull it out, and when I throw it on the ice, the wheel dogs turn around and eat it. This makes me throw up, and they eat that as well, and I spend the whole day and night running up the river, hacking blood and mucus and vomiting and hallucinating. When I approach a village that is the last checkpoint on the Yukon River, I look up on some cliffs on the left side of the river and see a bunch of crosses. We have been told about the graveyard to the south of the town, and I feel the ghost of all the dead in the graveyard welcoming me to the end of the river run. It is a warm feeling, a gentle calling. I nod to them and smile and turn off the river on the overland trail out to the Bering Sea. It is the end of the river and the end of day 11. Day 12. There is a change on this day, in the dogs and in me. We run down from the river out to the Bering Sea on a classic run. It is about zero or slightly above, and there is sun, and it is downhill for over 90 miles, and the dogs run to my mind. I have changed, have moved back in time, have entered an altered state, a primitive state. At one point, there is a long uphill grade, over a mile, and I lope alongside the sled easily, lightly, pushing gently to help the dogs. My rhythm, my movement is the same as the dogs. We have the same flow across the tundra, and I know then we will finish. We could run forever into the wind, across the short grass, run for all the time there has been and all the time there will be, and I know it, and the dogs know it. We come out to the coast of an Eskimo village, and one of the villagers, an older man, takes me in for the night and feeds me with great gentleness and talks to me while I sit in his small house. When my eyes close and won't open, he shows me a bed that he has prepared for me. As I go to sleep, I see him walk by, wearing only long underwear, and he looks the same as the man who saved me in the burn and earlier when I was sick. He has the same curved, strong shoulders and a quite soft strength. When I awaken some hours later and check the dogs and get ready for the run up the coast, he comes out to wish me well. We run out of the village north, with the sun coming up on our right, heading north again, the only direction, and it is the end of day 12. Day 13. There is something about the ocean that affects me. It is open offshore, not frozen, and blue from the sky, and though it's about 20 below, it is a soft cold and the dogs are full of it. They won't stop to rest, keep hitting the harnesses. One female named Blue starts shredding her harness with great glee as a joke each time I stop to feed or rest if I don't get her food fast enough. I am sitting in fourth to the last checkpoint when the race ends. We still have 200 or so miles to go across part of the ice on Norton Sound and it is completely over. They're having their banquets and the winner is being paid and there is cheering and I still have four days to go to finish. And we do not care. We run the hills easily, letting the team do as they wish. I simply stand on the back or push up the hills and do not care about winning or losing. Only the dance counts. The beauty is, as through the whole race, staggering. The hills, which would once have put me off with their steepness, are full of light and game. Clouds of ptarmigan rise like giant white snowflakes into a bright sun in front of the dogs, sometimes two, three hundred of them, and the strange arctic hares that stand on their back legs to see better are all over the place. They seem to be people, especially in the twilight as evening comes and the edges of hallucination start. I keep thinking that there are people standing in back of the bushes to watch us pass. Finally, the dogs can stand it no longer, and they take off from the trail, chasing one of the hares, and I get a thrilling ride down a long hill. The hare easily outdistances the dogs, and they wheel back up the hill in a single, sweeping circle. They do not care that they failed to catch him. The dogs fairly hum with energy as we slide gleefully down the final hills into the checkpoint just before we go out on the ice, and it is the end of day 13. Day 14. 
From Shuktaluk, we must cross Norton Sound. Depending on who is telling you, it is apparently about 60 miles of sea ice. Horror stories abound about the sound. Rumors. Somebody has gone through the ice and they found her team wandering alone. Somebody else went insane and is making big circles out on the ice, but nobody wants to stop him because he will be disqualified if he's given help. Somebody was found dead on her sled. Somebody was torn from his sled by the wind, and the dogs blew 30 miles across the ice sideways, and he didn't find them for two days. Somebody was on a large cake of ice, and it broke loose and headed out to sea. They are worried she will not be found or may drift across the Bering Sea to Russia. Somebody froze his eyeballs because he didn't blink enough and is blind but is finishing the race anyway. Somebody froze his nose, and it will have to be amputated. All of the rumors are virtually unfounded, but they rip through the area as they did at Rainy Pass, and I leave the checkpoint at dawn to head across the ice with some doubt. It is the end of day 14.